Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Lineup with Dave Proden. I'm Dave Proden, and this is episode 16. So the Australian leg of the WSL qualifying series is underway, and the story-filled Surfest Newcastle Pro and Doyle Partners Women's Pro, both QS 5000 events running from March 2nd to 8th, are in full flight. If you haven't already, start watching on WorldSurfLeague.com or the WSL app. These events are cornerstones of the first major regional leg of qualifying series events, wedged between the early competitions at Maroubra, Boomerang Beach, and Avoca Beach, and the upcoming major Challenger Series events at Sydney and across the pond at Piha. And I personally have had the good fortune of spending a little bit of time in Newcastle over the last few years as one of my best friends lives there. It's an awesome place, beautiful area, great people, and consistent waves that have played a huge role in developing a community of surfers with a staggering collective level of ability. If you paddle out for a dawn patrol at Dixon Park, you're just as likely to be blown away by the local school teacher as you are a former world champion. It's that kind of place. And the talent pool absolutely reflects that, producing the likes of Peter McCabe, Cole Smith, Mark Richards, Nikki Wood, Simon Law, Matt Hoy, Luke Egan, Ben Frawley, Craig Anderson, Philippa Anderson, Morgan Sibillic, amongst others. Iron sharpens iron, or in Newcastle's case, steel. And that's what we get into today. All right, episode 16. I've told this story before, but it bears repeating today. I quote unquote competed in surfing in high school and college and even fumbled through a few heats. Surfing and being in the water has always been a meditation for me, like most of us, even if I wasn't aware of it for most of my life. And concentrating on the goal of progression, part of which included testing myself against others through competition, was part of that focusing exercise. As Logan and I joked about last week in episode 15, the dream uh, however insane, of making the big leagues and surfing for a living was always there. However, the exposure to truly world-class surfers and an appreciation for just how good they are has been both calibrating and inspiring. So many surfers try, and so few succeed. And the delta between being hyped in the surf press and the surf industry, shining at pro junior and QS levels, then the elevated performance Valhalla of surfing at the CT is so, so vast. Today, we're speaking with someone who's not only traversed this delta, but is only getting started in raising his own performance amongst the elite. Our guest today is a dyed-in-the-wool product of the Australian steel city of Newcastle. Humble, powerful, and innovative. Following a sensational amateur career, he was pegged as one of the major emerging talents out of the lucky country and featured heavily in Kai Neville's cluster. He's suffered unfathomable loss at a young age, increased responsibilities, injury, doubt, and come through with more focus and ability than at any previous point in his life. And, for as humble as he is, it is undeniable that the goofy footer from Newcastle is a legitimate world beater. I can't wait to watch what he does in 2020. But first, please enjoy the lineup's conversation with Ryan Callanan. The good old clap, take one. That's right. <laughs> How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did, I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once, let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. <laughs> All right, well, Ryan Callanan, um, you know, it's 2020. Um, you're entering into your third full year on the CT. Um, and every, every year you've had a crack at it, you've had more success. What kind of goals and motivation do you start 2020 with for the championship tour? Um, I think for me, every year it's just about improving. Um, maybe not necessarily in results, but uh, making sure that my surfing's improving, that my mindset's improving, that I'm having fun. Um, and that doesn't always translate into, you know, better results or better rankings or anything like that. But as, I think as long as I'm having fun with it and moving forward in a good direction, then I'll, I'll be happy with how this year goes. And, and as far as your surfing's concerned, if you look back to 2016 to now in 2020, you know, what kind of parts of your surfing do you think you've improved upon the most? Um, there's, I think overall I've, I've had some big breakthroughs. Um, I, and I definitely think that the judging's changed. Obviously there's been a few head judges 
or one switch over and stuff like that. And I, I personally have definitely seen a, a different, a shift in, um, you know, the criteria and, and the themes that are set per events, obviously event to event, it changes, but, um, I felt like the first year I was on, I was maybe lacking a bit of flow and, uh, you know, having a lot of trouble completing full waves. I could do, felt like I was a bit, bit too raw, um, which has its ups and downs for sure. I, I felt like I could do one or two turns that were really good, but then maybe blots the third and then try and make up for it or something. Um, so I really felt like, you know, that year was a big learning curve for me in putting whole waves together. And, um, and now I feel it's almost gone back to that rawness and, you know, if it's exciting, dramatic, big moves, it doesn't necessarily have to be as smooth as silk and, and everything. Um, so now I'm really trying to bring that back in, which I think is a lot easier for me because I already had it. Um, and so to try and bring it back is, is exciting because uh, I maybe put it a bit too much in the, in the background for a while. And yeah, I think that's really what I'm looking forward to trying to improve on this year. Yeah, especially I think around those first two years, you were you were doing what a lot of young surfers do, which is a lot of sort of editorial stuff, film stuff, which which puts an emphasis on explosive surfing and, and single maneuvers. Um, and then on the CT as well, I, I would just argue, you know, this is my 15th year on tour now, like when I started you know, our tag was like world's best surfers, world's best waves, you know, rabbit, rabbit came up with it. And it wasn't always their best surfing in the live arena. You'd see you know, a, a pretty big Delta between what they did in competition and what they put out in like an edit. But I almost feel like now because of a variety of factors, including like the way the judges kind of interpret the criteria has encouraged all you guys and girls to really, in a lot of ways, put in your best performances in the live arena. Definitely. I, I feel that I've maybe struggled with that in uh, previous years, but if you watch guys like Philippe, Gabby, John, um, got Jordi, Italo, the guys that are at the top of the sport right now, their um, their best surfing is definitely done in those thirty minutes and priming themselves to be ready to perform and and bring out their best in those thirty. Um, I, f I feel like I kind of have almost, I don't think I was getting overlooked at all, but I was maybe uh, not strategically surfing as well as I could have uh, in my first year. And, and uh, so I felt that last year, especially, I maybe pulled it back a bit to, you know, just to get heat wins and stuff like that. Um, and it was... It worked. I had, had a really good year. I was really happy with how the results came out in the end. Obviously, you can always do better and stuff, but uh, just to requalify and, you know, I had a big goal of top 10, but, um, you know, just to get that requalification is through the tour. It's, it's huge for me. Um, and now my goals can keep going up and I can look for the top 10 again this year. But I think that, like you were saying, the – the surfing that people are doing in heats these days, you could nearly make what video parts were, you know, and what they used to be. Um, and that is super exciting to tune into a contest and know that you're going to see the best surfing in the world. You mentioned um, that you felt like you had a bit more rawness in your rookie year. And I remember, I, I remain a huge fan of yours, but like your rookie year, um, you had what I, I like to call like one of those Cansdale years where, you, you know, you, you were losing earlier, obviously, than you wanted to in contest, but you were going down with like 16 point heat totals in rounds where, you know, everyone else is getting 13 and getting through heats. And it's just, it does happen every now and then when you're like, this guy is so good. He, he can get excellent range scores. He's just running into other guys that are getting like half a point better heat totals. And, <laughs> and it's, it's really mind numbing. Like, what was your experience like in, in your rookie year? Uh, at the time, it was pretty frustrating. Um, I, I really, it was one of those things too where I was like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I, I feel like I'm surfing really well. I'm getting good waves. I'm pushing myself, but I just can't break through. So I was just kind of like, hang in there, keep it going. Like you'll bust through, but kind of never happened. Um, and <laughs> it's funny you say Ken's tell you because he's probably one of my favorite surfers too. But um, I yeah, I feel like there's always someone – every year that kind of has one of those years. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of factors that come into that. 
I obviously was drawing real, I came 10th on the QS, so I had a low seed to start with. I made one heat at Snapper, um, which I thought was going to set me up pretty well and then kind of just accumulated losses and losses. And then every time I'd surf, it would be me versus Gabby, me versus John, me versus Jordy. Um, and at the, yeah, at the time I was like, man, this is crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> how do you meant to beat these guys? But I also, looking back on it, it was maybe one of the best things for me because I really got to verse those guys, see how they performed in the water right next to them up close and personal, see what they were doing on the waves they got, how they structured their heats, which everyone's going to structure them differently, myself included. It's going to be completely different to Gabby or John or anyone. Um, but just to see kind of how they approached it and how, how much they were going for it every heat they were in. And I, I really felt like I had to step up to surf against those guys. And if you want to beat them, it's got to be black and white. And mine was always really close. So it's always probably going to go to the, uh, the top guys way, but it was, it was a really good learning experience for me. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think a lot of guys or girls, whether they're on tour or not, like process that kind of a challenge in that way. Like I think, you know, frustration can turn really destructive if it's if it's not sort of channeled, right? And y you've always seemed to be one of those guys that's able to challenge, cha channel um, that kind of stuff in the right way. I know um, you're big on meditation in a lot of ways. Like, is that something that's recent for you or is that something you were brought up doing? Uh, it's been pretty recent for me. I, um, yeah, I kind of maybe two years ago started two or three years um maybe just after just after i fell off tour maybe the end of the next year so hasn't been a thing and, and like i said at the time it was actually quite frustrating for me to do that and i don't think i was processing actually how good an experience in it the was. moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was like man this sucks i'm just getting smoked by these guys but i'm serving really well and i'm improving but it's just not coming on my way um but yeah meditation was really after some pretty heavy personal experiences i I, f I just felt I needed something and um, I'd obviously heard a lot about it. I kind of, I don't know, I don't actually talk about it that much. I I still feel people think it's like a hippie la -dee da thing, but it, it's quite common these days. And I got into it by reading a Tim Ferriss book, actually, Tools of Titans, and there was, which is a lot of guys he does a podcast with and they're top performers in whatever field and it was phenomenal how many people were doing it from there. And I had, uh, I think I, I actually had an injury at the time. It was around Hawaii, had the two months off that I was normally in Hawaii and just thought, I'll, I'll give it a go. And the changes I saw were just monumental. So I really, yeah, I've kept it going ever since. And is that a daily practice for you or? Daily practice, yeah, yeah every morning. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, can you speak a little bit about those changes? Are they in the water, out of the water, body changes, performance changes, sort of like, I guess, sort of psychology approach to kind of everyday life changes or maybe a combination? Um, I would go psychology approach to everyday life. I definitely felt a lot calmer, less stress, um, which all of this stuff, as much as it is on land, it all accumulates into the water and being calmer when you're in a stressful situation or if, you know, things around you aren't going as you planned, then um, being able to, you know, just settle yourself. And and I, I felt for me really it's about being in the moment, not worrying about the future or the past or what's happened before or what could happen or what's going to happen because you never really know. But I think those things and just settling me in the moment and that's when I've – had my best performances. It's when I've been my best self. Um, but yeah, it's it like I, I think I noticed it, but I think uh, a lot of people around me noticed a, a change as well. And and it's definitely comes and goes. I, I feel it hasn't just stayed a steady boat the whole time. Um, I've had my ups and downs as well, but it's something that I could always turn to to try and settle myself. Yeah, I wonder when we were in Hawaii last season, we were at Pipe and obviously we had like significant waves and you know, I'm 36, I'm not I'm not Captain Fitness, but I remember um one of the guys coming up the stairs and we were talking, we we're catching up and I'm like there's not 
you know, on the scale of like the human experience, like a huge delta, like physiologically between me and the CT surfer. But I was just reflecting on like a surf I'd had a couple of days before that at sunset. And I was like, I, I was so sore and so gassed. And I'm like, I can't understand how you guys can go out and like surf at backdoor and off the wall for like hours on end and get pounded. Like, I'm like, I just don't understand like the gap physi- physically. <laughs> but I do think a lot of it is maybe a, a, runs into what you're talking about too, which is like psychology, being able to stay calm and being able to process things. And I think, you know, for someone like myself that doesn't have that experience in those situations, the, the impact that stress can have on your body and the way it tires you out and the way it makes you sore compared to um, someone who, who does have that comfort level or does that mental work. I, I think that could be a factor. Well, I would say that pipe's probably the best place to practice it. <laughs> um, with the crowd and the the power and everything that's going on, it, like, it's easy to get frustrated out there, especially when you're watching all these good waves and uh, it's really hard to get one. So it's quite a good place to practice if you can, if you can handle or settle yourself out there, you're doing pretty well. But um, yeah, I I think that almost emotional drainage, draining uh, things will be more than physical. I definitely get tired and stuff like that. But um, like, yeah, having to put yourself in those situations day in, day out, I definitely get to a point where I'm like, oh, like, I think I need a break. I'm just like out here because I feel like I have to be or... Right. I'm um, just pushing myself because I want to learn the break or I want to surf or the waves are good. Um, I'm not actually benefiting from it. I, I probably am just by being out here, but it's not like I'm out here going like, come on, let's do this. I'm yeah. keen to get a good one or I'm keen to improve this or test this board or something. Um, I feel like if I wear myself down mentally, then I really need and I feel like mentally comes first and then my body kind of follows. So I'll get run down or something like that if I just push myself and push myself. But mentally it'll be a, a trigger that like, okay, you need to take a break and uh, recover for a day or two and get the froth back and, and get excited again. For sure. You mentioned um, that you've had to go through some heavy stuff. I mean, you're still a really young guy. You're 27 and, um, you know, you you really, you know, sadly you lost your dad to cancer. Um really right before your rookie season started in um, 2016 and you lost your mom unexpectedly, you know, less than a year and a half later and had to become the, the caretaker for your sisters. I mean, all it, I think you were still 24. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's like an insane amount for anyone. Um, and I know like tragedy and like losing people, it's a part of life, but I, I'm, if you're open to it, I'd like to hear how you, you feel like you navigated that and from your perspective. Yeah, it's obviously a, t- a tough period. Um, I, for me, it was a really good perspective shift as well. Um, it was something that I never really expected to happen. Uh, my dad was super healthy surfed every day he worked hard but he wasn't like working himself into the ground or anything he always made time for activities he was always uh just loved being active and um so you know to see him get sick was pretty uh i actually and it and it's probably a um now a, a thing that I see that I was really trying to push things away and not face things at the time. Like he was sick for a a fair while before I even acknowledged or asked him anything about it, but I could sense something was wrong, but it just was so, oh, it was so painful for me to even uh, acknowledge. So, um, and I think that really, you know, continued on into my, when he did pass away, um, and then, yeah, like you said, he passed away right before the contest in Newcastle, this contest. Um, and then it was my first year on tour. So I was doing QSCT. I was away for, say, 10 months of the year. And I didn't really give myself time or permission to even open up to that. It was just like, okay, yeah, I'll deal with that later. Um, yeah. Under this next comment. This A lot next of comp. distractions. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you like right now, I would say definitely unfortunately, 
but at the time it, it felt like the right thing to do and I didn't want to deal with it. Um, but it was damn painful for sure. And when I did uh, finally open up to it at the end of the year, I think I was knocked out of the sunset, knocked, and then just before pipe, I, and to me, I really felt that <laughs> at the time, personal and professional lives were completely separate. Um, I could go and surf and deal with and surf my best and, and be in a good head frame and uh, all that kind of stuff uh, without the personal side of things and everything on that side being right, which I know now doesn't, they have a certain bleed and this one was like basically the same thing. It was just, uh, it was brutal, but I, I didn't realize that till much later. Uh, so I kind of processed it at the end of that year and fallen off tour was ready for the next year. And then, yeah, I think it was mother's day, uh, the, the next year, right before the Japan QS and I, my mum passed away and that one was really sudden. So I kind of had both experiences of experiences yeah. of my dad's was quite long and uh, drawn out. So I kind of got to see, uh, saw him deteriorate and we always had hope, but um, there was a point there where I was thinking this isn't looking good where mum's happened really suddenly and, and she just seemed to drop out of nowhere. Um, which was much more painful for me, I think, because it felt like there was no time to process and it was kind of like, this can't be happening. Right. Um, but I feel for the grief side of things, it was much more beneficial. Um, I had to deal with it on the spot. I felt like I was dealing with both of them actually, like a truck had just hit me of emotions and I uh, really, because as much as I'd opened up to my father's passing, I'd probably shoved it so deep down that there was still some residual stuff way down that I had to deal with. And when my mum passed away, they both kind of hit me. Um, I had a few months off competing and it was, yeah, it was, it was a pretty brutal time. But um, we, ha we have a really nice community at our house. We have lovely, supportive, extended family and family. And they, they definitely helped a lot. Um, Billabong, my sponsors were really supportive. If they told me if I wanted to take the rest of the year off, that was fine. Um, I had like a lot of obviously thoughts going through my head and and but like I said earlier it really put things into perspective about what was important to me was surfing the most important thing in my life at the time um and <laughs> it kind of took a complete backseat at that time I still surfed because I love it it's it was it's really calming for me it's what I've always done I I don't think I could ever give up surfing. So it was one of those things that it was a no brainer that I was always going to continue, but, um, it definitely wasn't like, okay, I've got to qualify right now. This is, this is it. Um, I was kind of like, oh, well, um, I don't really know where I'm at. I want to take care of my sisters. I want to make sure they're all good. How, how old were they at the time? Um, I think I was 24 and they were 23 okay 22 sorry 22 yeah. yep yeah. um and you know we were lucky enough and blessed enough to have beautiful parents that helped us but also the girls were still living at home um uh mom and dad helped them a lot with their bills and everything like that so and even for me i i'd only just moved out a year before um and I was kind of still learning about <laughs> all this real life adult stuff that happened. So I got to pay it every month. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Yeah, exactly. That was, well, that was a huge one. Yeah. Like, well, this bill comes in and that bill comes in. And then it wasn't just uh, bills for me or bills for them. It was bills for the house and bills for the phone bill, all that, you know, just stuff that everyone deals with all the time. But you just never think of how much is actually there until it, it all starts coming in at once. And you're like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to take care of this now? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think it was, you know, I, I took that year and I actually, I kept competing. I, and then I think it was that year I, I had a really bad, um, 
uh, yeah, patella tendonitis in my knees. Mm. And I made a few heats through Europe and stuff, but I could barely surf. I was just kind of going through the motions. I knew something was wrong. And, um, and that was when I took the time off. And that was maybe the best thing I've done for my career and my personal self in a long time was just to, you know, take that time and say, I'm not going to pull out of Hawaii. Uh, I've got enough points to be in the primes for next year so I can set myself up there. But um, this time is just for me to make sure my body's in order, my mind's in order, everything's kind of running smoothly and I can focus on a good 2018. Yeah, 2018. (laughs) Um, And I'm curious, um, you know, as far as getting both your body and your mind in order, obviously there's a, a, a training component for patella tendonitis and, and I'm interested to hear about that. Did you did you see anyone for the mental side? Did you did you have any help there? Yeah, I've got a um a sports psychologist that works for Surfing Australia, a really good one, Jason yeah. Patchell. So I was speaking to him quite a lot about everything, you really. Sure? Yeah. Um he really helped me. Yeah, I was I was trying to connect a, a bit. Probably I should be connecting with him more now, but still keeping it going. I, I talk to him a lot, but um, but then that, at that point I was talking to him most like once or twice a week. And uh, yeah, but I think for the mental side of stuff too, I was just really, I don't know. It was, it was, a, it was a period where I didn't necessarily have any goals because I didn't know what they were. Um, I just lost my parents. I had my sisters who I loved. I was not necessarily looking after them. They were old enough to look after themselves, but definitely keeping an eye on them. Um, and making sure that, uh, they were all good and had what they needed, um, as, as well as doing that for me. And it was, you know, just, I just felt like I had a finally had a few months where, as you know, Dave, this tour just kind of runs and runs and runs and runs, and you get a few months at the start of the year, and but even then, it's like, oh, okay, we'll get ready for the next year because it's all coming up. So I felt like that was really a time where I just went like, oh, I've got nothing to do, not do, but no goals, no nowhere to be. I'm just I'm just trying to sort out my knees. The discipline of kind of going through those procedures, I think also helped me mentally because it kept me quite disciplined in my mind. And, and, uh, I really feel that that has a huge impact on, you know, holding your own power and making your own decisions. Um, and I felt like I came out of the other side of that and into, um, 2018 kind of ready to go. And, I don't know whether I was ready. I don't know whether you're ever ready, but um, I felt better. I felt a lot better and a lot more relaxed and a lot more myself. Um, I was doing surfing for the right reasons. I surfing because I loved it. Well, some, sometimes you you just have to have that breath, you know. Like, <laughs> when, when did you? When when would you say you actually started getting paid as a professional surfer? Like, fifteens. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah. like, a, and as you said, like. The, the tour is one thing that never ends, but then like the sponsorship requirements and the press requirements and the free surfing stuff, it, it is. And because we love it, like we're lucky to be able to work in something that we would do even if we didn't get paid probably. There's really, it's very hard to stop, right? <laughs> like you, it's, it, I mean, and you can look almost across anyone, man or, man or woman, like across the tour or in the industry, like, you know, and, and a lot of times you have to have those really hard situations to force you to stop, you know, and take a breath and then kind of calibrate and say, oh, okay, you know. Absolutely. It's, it takes, yeah, like you said, I, I get home and it's meant to be my off time and I'm just so like, oh my gosh, I want to go surfing and I want to see this person and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And then I just end up more tired than before I got there and it's meant to be my recharge time. So, yeah, like you said, it, it's hard to actually take a break and completely switch off from what we're doing um, because it's a blessing and a curse. But the thing that we, the thing that I do for a job is also the thing that I love to do. So if I am taking some time off, I'm still going to be doing 
I'm still going to be surfing every day because I love it. Um, you you mentioned um, you know the extended family mm -hmm. thing and and it's something that I've found like in my own life a lot. Like you you've got your family, you've got your friends, and you know these networks. Whether it's for some people, it's like um, a school, or for some people, it's a sport, or for some people, it's a religion. Like that extended family is so important. Um, and Newcastle is is a place that I've been fortunate enough to go um, a bit. Um, and I, it's a really interesting place and, um, you know, there's really fun waves and really good people and there's, there's so many good surfers, um, with so many accomplishments. And I wanted to ask you, um, where does, uh, Ben Frawley's 2016 <laughs> Mr. Cliff title rank amongst those accomplishments of the, uh, Newcastle? I, I would say pretty high, but I have, um, never actually competed or been invited to compete in it. So I don't know the prestige precisely. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he mentioned that, um, well, he's from, he's from Merriweather or as we call it, South Dixon. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll let him know. But uh, in, in all seriousness, Frost does rip in all seriousness. Uh, you can kick my ass if I don't say that or just hassle me on text message. The, um, but yeah, but in all seriousness, like that community is really special as far as surfing is concerned. Absolutely. They've, like Merriweather board riders is a huge part of how I've grown up, but, and I have to thank them for everything they've done for me and my family. And, uh, my dad was a huge part of the club as well, but even reaching beyond that, the whole Newcastle surfing community is, and just the community in general, actually not even the surfers. It, it's, a city but it feels like a small town it feels like everyone kind of knows everyone and um it's it's a phenomenal place to be brought up and live I'll, yeah i uh probably i don't think i'll ever move from there but i definitely owe that place a lot i mean in addition to um obviously your dad and um mark richards ben frawley who were some of the other guys that when you were growing up that you really looked up to in the area um, it was, it was, a uh, kind of when I was growing up, there was a lot of guys and I was probably too young to understand actually what they were doing for the sport and stuff. But, um, like there was guys, Matt Hoy and Luke Egan, and that's the thing, like, I'm sure, well, I hope <laughs> I have this effect, but they were heroes but because they were traveling a lot i never really got to see them same as the qs guys mitchell ross travis lynch yeah. um you know and so they they weren't around as much as maybe some of the guys that i would surf with every day at home and were my kind of they they were the guys i was surfing with and pushing myself against and, and stuff like that so when they would come home and I would get to see them, it was so exciting and so like mind blowing to see how well they surfed. But guys, my age, there was, um, Craig Anderson moved from South Africa when he was 14. He's become one of my really good friends, but he was phenomenal. Jesse Adam, a uh, guy named Wes Bainbridge, who was a year older than me, but he used to just demolish the whole, uh, you know, under 16s, under 14s, under 12s, when we were that, he was he was such a good surfer. So I think those guys that were when I was young, they were just a bit older and they were around a lot more. Um, almost the <laughs> the older guys, not until I personally got a bit older, and maybe they'd stopped on tour or I'd realised actually what they'd done and how good they were. Um, Trav's now one of my really good friends and I surf with him a lot. Uh, Rossi, obviously, he does a lot of the tour with Carissa and Hurley and I see him everywhere. Um, Hoyo's at home all the time. Luke does a lot. Of, Luke Egan is coaching Julian at the moment and uh, does a lot of the tour and is always there for little tips. And Mark Richards, I, <laughs> he's, he's one of the greats of the sport and he's so humble and nice and... Every time I park out the front of his house to run out for a surf and he sees me, he always comes down for a quick chat or he's sending me text messages. And, and you know, like when I was growing up, they maybe didn't have that big of effect because I didn't really appreciate or know the accomplishments that they'd had until I was old enough to really understand. 
but now they're just influential in my life. And you mentioned it too, like it is a city, but it has a small town feel. So even the guys that weren't traveling, and my observation has been even the people that live there and work there and have families there, but just love surfing and surf every day. It's such a high level of surfing talent. Um, I don't know what you call them, like civilians or whatever, <laughs> but like, but like, it's true. I mean, we travel all over the world and, and there's definitely a spectrum of some of the places you go, just the people that live there really, really good. And, you know, comparatively in Newcastle and Meriwether feels like one of those places. Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of my friends are just really good surfers. Like I get to surf and they're probably people that most people would never heard of, or they've done the junior series and then they're <clears throat> for one reason or another it wasn't for them or they didn't think they could quite make it or something but they're kind of guys that I surf with every day and they still push me a lot so um, I'm really fortunate to have friends like that and just people around that yeah like you said there's kids coming up um, Jackson Baker, Morgan Sibelik, uh who you know they're phenomenal surfers as well and there's just a lot of talent there and the waves are fun. They're not like, they get good occasionally, like anywhere, I guess on their day, they're pretty amazing. But um, yeah, it, it has con consistent waves and there's a consistent community and, and a lot of people pushing each other. And I, I feel like that's why the caliber is so high. If you look at the board riders battle in 2019, um, Merriweather won the Australian championships and we had most of our team, most of our best guys were injured. Um, I had a sore rib, Jackson Baker had a sore ankle and it was kind of the, not, and I say this as, um, as nice as I can, but the second tier team, like they're all phenomenal surfers and they took it out. And I think it's really a testament to our, our club and our community as how good our team is. We, we don't need the best guys to win. We, they, they can put out our second team and still do some damage. Yeah, it's, I mean, the depth there is, is really impressive. And, and obviously having the event there, which, which is going to be happening soonish based on yeah. whenever we release this, is it's a huge thing because it, I, I think it's like a rallying point for the community. You get to... If you're a little kid, you get to see um, maybe the person that works in the coffee shop or the person that you see at the surf shop, like they're out there competing against an international field. And it's, I, I think it's just one of those things that's such an important part of the community in a lot of ways. For sure. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't know whether people like pride themselves on being like good surfers. I'm sure a lot of people do, but there's just a lot of good surfers around. Um, Going back to what I said before, actually, when we've had our best team, we've never won. So maybe the second team's better than the best team. Um, maybe that is the best team and they should keep it. But I, I think that, you know, there's just, there is that caliber there and, and they're always going to keep pushing themselves and there's always going to be new kids coming along to keep pushing the older guys. And there's definitely a level of respect there for the people that have been and done what they've done. And, and then there's us that are thriving and striving to be like them. Um, and, you know, we've got really good role models to look up to. You mentioned, um, you know, there's a lot of people that you grew up with who were really, really good at, at this level or that level, but they, they fell off for whatever reason. As far as your own career trajectory, was there ever any kind of moment, I guess, that, that tipped the scales either way for you where you were like, well, you know, I was thinking about doing something else um, <laughs> instead of being a pro surfer. Or was it something that you were always like, no, 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 this is, I'm always going to do this. Or I'm, I'm just curious as to between the pro juniors and the QS, what that looked like for you and where the confidence came from to, to make a run at the world tour. There was probably a few moments. Uh, I, when I was in year 10, I, I dropped out at the end of year 10 and my mom and dad had this big battle about like mum wanted me to stay in school and dad owned a company that did like structural landscaping and um, retaining walls and stuff and he was like you can drop out work for me surf or you can continue on to year 11 and 12 which I actually had to change schools and it was kind of felt like a really big deal but it probably wasn't <laughs> <laughs> it's a big deal when you're in year 10 <laughs> like you know yeah if was, you think if you think getting monthly bills is hard yeah. like at that level you're like whoa <laughs> for sure I was 16 and I was like I just want to go surfing like I'm not 
super smart at school. I was kind of probably neutral in the in the range. I uh, didn't really put in that much effort. Um, I think because I just figured I'd be a pro surfer. Mm. I don't know whether that was actually why, but I, that was the that was the path I thought saw myself taking. So I dropped out. Um, do you regret dropping out, or do you think that it was the right thing to do at the time? I think it was the right thing to do at the time. Sure. Yeah, I I think school's incredible. I I actually wish I think I would learn more if I went back now than at the time. It's funny, like it's the same thing. Like I I think. You know, it, a lot of people, I'd, I'd just speak for myself, like you fight and fight and fight school <laughs> just because you're supposed to be doing it. And then you get older and you're like, you kind of read more and you, you're pursuing sort of knowledge in your own way and at your own pace. And you're like, you know, I, I wish I, I wish, I wish I could go to school in like my 30s and 40s. I think I'd be like way better at it yeah. be, because I kind of appreciate it more. Absolutely. I, I feel the same. I was picking classes maybe because they were easier or they had a nicer teacher or something like that. There was less work or I don't know what it was. But, yeah, I, I really feel that if there was a gap year or something and I went back a few years later, I might have taken it a bit different. But Was, I, was homeschooling an option then? I know that's a thing now. but I think people were doing it, but yeah. I didn't never saw it as an option. Yeah. I, I really liked the social side of school and sure. went through all primary school, high school with my friends and still my friends now. But... Um, I think that's like an important muscle to build too, yeah, like just as part sure. of school. Like, and yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. I, I obviously a lot of the kids coming up through all of the systems, um, WSL or not, or even like surfing or not, like the the focus and concentration it takes to get to an elite level is is often like, well, they're going to go homeschooled. And I wonder what you miss out, like yeah. when you do that, in terms of what sort of social muscles you you don't develop. You definitely, yeah, definitely build up a bit more of a social tolerance or uh just learning how to act in a lot of different situations at school i think because there's all different types of people that some you want to hang with some you don't want to hang with but you're forced to because you're in the same class or whatever that's but, not unlike the qs <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i think that dropping out was a, a good point for me i got to work which if I'm being completely honest, wasn't very much. But uh, my dad was very lenient. It's good to have your dad as a boss. He, I got to do, I think I was doing three days a week so I could surf the other four. And then um, I would have extra days if I was about to go away and extra just a day or two to recover when I got home. So all in all that next year, I probably worked about 30 to 45 days. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But that, I, that, that might be higher than the average <laughs> for most like junior pro surfers. I'm just saying, like. uh, but it was, I actually enjoyed the work. It was, it was hard. It was, it was shoveling stuff. It was building, it was moving big blocks and pushing tires around and all kinds of just manual labor. But it was, I did it with a really good friend of mine. Um, obviously my dad owning the company, I knew all the project managers and everything. So they were, probably a bit more friendly to me than they would have been to another kid. But um, but I really liked them all. And every time I would shoot home from there, I would be just stinging for a surf, like frothing to get in the water. And I think that that kind of perspective of this is what I could be doing, but this is really what I want to be doing is was a real game changer for me. And it got to the point where there was just too many contests or too many trips or I had to do this thing for Billabong or I had to do a trip here or a contest there and, and it was just, I, uh, there was no days in between. I had maybe a week at home as it gets and then a few few days here, a few days there and, and I just didn't couldn't fit any more work in, <laughs> which um, I think my dad had kind of, I guess he'd hoped for in a way that's if, if you... I th I'd lo I think he was the kind of person that he wanted to see me succeed in what I wanted to do and he knew that that was a huge goal of mine. So I guess he knew that it was kind of going to go that way in the end. Um, maybe not as quick <laughs> as he'd hoped. But, uh, <laughs> maybe his system in terms of like breeding the Australian mongrel into you just because of that perspective really did work in a lot of ways. Like I, I mean, again, it's probably not something where it's like, yeah, that's all you got to do and you'll be sweet. But... I would imagine that just like a, 
void of any other experience, that appreciation for being able to surf and have that be your profession instead of what else you could be doing in a lot of ways is like, yeah, no, I'm going to go out and win this heat because that's, I'm coming from there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually probably should go back and do some more days on the tour <laughs> to give me some more perspective. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's, I would recommend it to any young person that wants to be a pro surfer, just, you know, have a few weeks, a few months on the tools or whatever you choose to do. It's, it's a really good um, eye opener of, you know, the different kind of lives that people live and, and how lucky we are to get to just go and surf whenever we want um, and definitely takes away the complacency for a while. Um, and then there was, there was maybe another time back to your first question of pinnacle moments where um, after I fell off and then my parents passed away and it was into it was actually the year I qualified, but it was at the start. And I thought I'd managed my injury really well. And I went back and surfed in Newcastle and Manly and my knees were just shot still. Like I didn't, I thought they were almost better and they just kind of lingered. They, to be honest, they still linger now. I have how, to- How do you manage a patella tendonitis? Um, uh, <laughs> well, I, actually, let me reframe. Yeah. How are you supposed to manage it? <laughs> what, what are you doing or not doing? Um, no, I think I'm to the point now where they're pretty, pretty damn good. But yeah. um, at the time, it, it's like you have to work the tendon to get muscle in them. It's not a rest and they'll get better kind of thing. So you have to, it's almost like you're building up their tolerance for what they can handle. And when you get tendonitis, it's like overuse almost. So you need to start from the bottom. They take 72 hours to repair. Um, so say you'd have a high day, a middle day and a low day, maybe even two low days to let them recover. The high day for me was surfing cause it was a lot of bending, jumping, um, painful. And I would get to the point where I'm like, okay, that's really sore. I got to stop. And then the midday would be weight stuff to build up all the muscles around it. And then two off days. And then I would did that cycle, cycle for yeah. a few months and to the point where I thought they were pretty good, but then I started to compete again. And then it was like, okay, free surf now. And, and I got to get ready for the comp. And, oh, this doesn't fit in with the schedule I just had of having a couple off days. Um, they're really sore right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I definitely had some moments there where I was like, are these things ever going to get better? Like this, this could be the end of me. Um, and as, as much as it sucks to say that, I definitely had those thoughts running through, especially when an injury's gone on for what felt like all eight months or something. Um, and to be like, fair enough, the first three, I probably didn't deal with it at all and, and they got worse and worse. But then the last kind of six, I was pretty heavily dealing with them and I was like, oh, six month injury's a long one. Like, and they feel like they've gotten better, but I'm still having to manage them. Uh, and I definitely had some moments where I really needed to just kind of step back and I actually, you know, it's hard for me to say probably, but I have maybe accepted that this wasn't the path for me, um, that, you know, this was going to end my career potentially, uh, which I think again is is coming back to where my surfing maybe changed a bit because um, I've heard them say it a lot on the commentary recently, but the wounded surfers one to watch out for. <laughs> um, but I really just stepped back. I, if I was at an event, my management went completely different. I would surf only in the morning and just to get them moving, and then I would surf my heats and airs kind of felt like out of the question because the, the impact of landing and, and springing was huge on them. So if I did did airs for a whole session, I was probably out for three days. Um, and so I feel like that whole process really kind of, in the end, it's been a really positive experience for me because of where it's got me and where it's kind of made me take my surfing. And it's not necessarily a different route, but it's just, maybe a different way than I thought it would get there. Um, and, but yeah, I definitely had some moments and I went to Japan and I kind of almost accepted that like, yeah, I'm just going to go like, I'm not going through the motions. I'm here to win, but I'm not, 
I really wanted to win a comp, but my knees were not great. I'm just kind of getting through. And like I said earlier about the discipline, I really had to be like I was staying with people who were frothing to surf and, yeah, let's go here and let's go there. And I was like, okay, I'm going to sit this one out. And I had to be like, this is about me. Um, It's hard to say no. Oh, man, especially when the waves are fun. Like I'm sure every surfer out there knows how hard when there's good waves to sit on the beach and watch is. It's And you, you are able to, but like I guess it's that delayed gratification of okay, if I do this, it's going to be sore for my heats tomorrow. Um, and I think I'd really just accepted that whatever was going to happen was going to happen. Hopefully I was going to get through the year or a few years. Maybe it would just be the QS. Maybe I would never get back to the level that I wanted to be at. Um, and then I actually went on and won the contest. So <laughs> it was like almost that acceptance of, this is it, like, you know, just do what you can do and it's okay. I think that almost put me into a mind frame of it doesn't matter anymore and I went out and um, I was competing really well. I was surfing the waves I got really well. My my prep and my management of my knees was insane. Well, what it, exactly what it needed to be and it all worked in – perfectly and and it was the first QS contest I'd ever won at that moment and it was almost like this big flip-flop of like oh maybe it's not over here hold on (laughs) so I yeah I was gonna say I think that that clarity of mind and like really as you kind of you mentioned like the wounding wounded animal thing like that animal instinct those things combined are really powerful right because you're just processing everything in, Mm. in like a heightened state in a lot of ways yeah, absolutely. And and taking it back to the meditation and just trying to be in the moment. I um, was not focused on my knees are hurting. I was like, this is how they feel right now. This is probably what I can do. This is the maximum. This is so I'm going to have to get the best waves, surf them to the best that I can. Um, and it was just really like embracing the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen. I might get good waves. I might not. I might surf them well or not but I'm just going to go out there and do my best and and see where it takes me and um I'd always had trouble once I got to the quarters because it was like I could see the end goal and I was like I'm so close uh but that contest was really a turning point for me of I'm in the quarters but I'm not going to get too excited because I don't know what's going to happen and the, the rest of your year was was pretty impactful too. You had a huge run in Europe. You got the wild card in France, and I remember we reconnected in France when we were there. And and it was, it, it, and you it, you're a pretty humble guy, but like I, I think the surfing world collectively is like this is a top five talent. We really want him back on on tour. I mean, none of us really probably knew anything about the knees or anything, but um, it was just such a good thing. And I think everyone was just so excited to see you back on the CT and really sticking it to people. A, seeing you do so well in the QS in Europe, and then B, um, getting the wild card into France, and then and and knowing like how well you surfed, and knowing that it was like an elite level talent, and then seeing you kind of make a run through the draw. That that's that was really special for us. I can only imagine how it was for you. Yeah, very very special. I like you said earlier. I I felt like I got to show my potential the first year or kind of some of what I was capable of, but it just never really shone through into results. So, and I definitely had my things. I was working through at France. Like I obviously was coming off a win in the QS, which was super exciting at Irisera. But then walking back down the beach in France and having all those memories of, oh man, last time I was here, it was, is that going to happen again? Um, I was really like, oh, man. But everyone was obviously really excited to see me there, which was really cool. Uh, that was we, we were just sick of all the guys on tour. <laughs> we were like, oh, cool, get out of the way. This is Ryan's back. Yeah, needed a fresh face. That's right. But, um, yeah, it was really, really exciting to see. Probably, it was probably more exciting to see how excited everyone was for me. Um, and then I obviously had a really good run through the contest but I had my first heat with it's it's one of the other things I've struggled with I had it after Japan where I 
I won the contest and then I was like, my expectations just go through the roof and I'm like, okay, now I've won, I've got to qualify, I've got to do this. And then I had two really bad results and then I was like, okay, people win events all the time and don't qualify, it's all good. And then I won Aracera. And then I went to France going like, yes, this is where I want to be. I'm versing these guys. I'm versing, I think I had Gabriel in my first heat with Thomas Hermes. And I was like, yes, good. Okay, I'm going to beat these guys. And then I lost. <laughs> and I came in, I was so pissed off with myself. And I was like, hold on. Is this really how you want your experience to go? Like, are you going to get bummed on yourself every time you lose? Because you lose a lot more than you win. It's just how it is in this sport. And I was walking up the beach and there was kids running up for autographs and I was like kind of not shrugging them off, but I was giving them and then I just had this full moment of like, this is this is fun. This doesn't this contest right now doesn't mean anything to you. You're on the QS. It's it's a complete bonus. Like this isn't how you want to act after events, after heats, after anything. And I really felt like that moment had a real impact on my whole event and the rest of it was like, I just want to go out and surf. I just want to show you, the world, the WSL, exactly what we'd spoken about, what we've spoken about before and just show them that I can surf and I'm just going to do my best. We ended up getting a funnest left rip bowl, which we never <laughs> seemed to get in here at comps as uh, Probably not enough lefts for me on tour, but um, yeah, we had a super fun rip bowl and I really felt like I got to open up and, and I felt really free the whole event. Yeah. And you qualified that year. You went into last season, uh, 2019. What, what was the headspace kind of having gone through everything you went through? Um, and I know I said it was your, what was it your, that was your second year on tour sorry yep. i'm trying to keep track <laughs> we're coming right. up on your third <laughs> but your second year on tour um <laughs> i mean the relativity of time feels like a billion years ago um like how, what was your headspace going into that year you'd been through so much i was really excited uh, i i was i think because i got obviously second in france and then I actually got in the last three events of the year. So that almost felt like a really good warm up for me. And they were the best results I'd ever had on CTs. I had the second and then I got, uh, um, I think it was, I think it's the 17th that year, this year, or 13th, mm -hmm. 13th. Um, and then a ninth at Pipe as well. So that kind of felt like a good warm up for me and a, just a real like, okay, here at like, you can do this now. Like you've, you've showed yourself, you've showed the world, but you know, these results are here for you to take. And so I think that then went from excitement to a bit of expectation. And I was like, yep, I'm going to, I had a really big goal to make the top five, which actually through the start of the year was looking quite good. I was, I think seventh for a while. Um, and then it kind of just stepped, stayed pretty stagnant and I started going a bit backwards. But um, anyway, at the start of the year, it was really good. <laughs> Let's focus on the start of the year. Yeah, I, I probably put a bit too much expectation on myself. I actually, really good thing, I had Gabriel and a uh, wild card, Matthias Hurdy in my first heat. And that was perfect for me at that time. I was like, okay, great. This is where I want to be. I got to beat these guys. He's the world champ. And I want to beat him and I got nothing to lose. I'm um, first year back like, and this year it changed to first and second get through and he beat me by just a little bit, but it was really good just for me to be out there and have that kind of, I want to verse this guy, I want to beat this guy. And then I felt like the expectation kind of, I kept just building and then I had Geordie in round three and I was like, let's go again, here we go. But I think it got a bit too intense and kind of locked me up a bit. Um, then yeah, Bells was, I really was almost a similar moment to France where I went, all right, that was not how I wanted to feel around my events. I wanted them to be fun and, um, and loose and, and I just want to kind of, you know, let my surfing do the talking and, and not have all this talk up here. Like I've got to win, I've got to do this. So, I uh, just see how it goes. And. And I felt like I really got to open up down there and got the best result of my year. But um, yeah, it was that kind of 
started my year off, I felt really, really well to have that kind of thing to pull me back and humble me maybe at the start and then kind of allowed me to open up and, and gain some confidence. You know, all professional surfers kind of, they're on a spectrum between, you know, hyper competition focused and then free surfing. And then most everyone kind of falls between where they do a bit of both. Like, where would you self-assess yourself on that spectrum between competition and free surfing? Now? Yeah. Pretty competition focused. Uh, until I like, it's really competition focused. I'll surf the, the event break a lot. I'll break down heats, I'll surf still a bit of knees management um, and stuff, but it's all prep for competition. And then I feel like as soon as I lose, this switch just flicks and I'm like, all right, I want to go and try the biggest thing I've ever done and, and I want to go and get a crazy photo and get clips and I just start like chasing my tail that way, which which never really ends up happening. But that's like as soon as I lose in the contest or – However it is, I, that's how I feel. It's like I want to just go out and and it's normally the surfing that I didn't get to do in the heat that I want to emulate and go and do. Um, and I find that but that doesn't last that long and especially because the events are so short together, it's normally move to the next one, start prepping for that one, get used to the breaks and the waves and the boards and everything. So... Uh, I'd love to think that my – I definitely think I'm hyper competition focused, but I also feel that the best way for me to improve is focusing on – and I'm improving the whole year just focusing on competition and surfing the waves and everything like that. I, I definitely feel I've, I've come leaps and bounds from the start of the year. But I feel that the creativity and, and that kind of side of surfing and, and learning new things and getting crazy clips and stuff is a way that I improve more than ever. It sounds like it's it's almost like another management system that you have yeah. to crack. I mean, because you have had like major free surfing success. You know, you featured in Kai Neville's cluster. You you know, despite your admission that maybe you're not that successful in getting those clips, like clips are constantly coming out in photos and it is, I think you would be classified as one of those rare breeds of, you know, elite level talents that also have a huge impact in the free surfing space as well. Um, but I was interested because I, I'm, I'm sure at some point in your career, you're like, no, oh, maybe I, I don't have to put the singlet on. I can just kind of pursue this. But from what I understand, talking to guys that, that do that, that's not easy either. Yeah, I, I actually think it's a lot harder than people think. Um, I lived with Craig Anderson for a year Uh and I'm really good friends with him. And he is probably one of the premier free surfers at the moment. He's definitely one of my favorites, but, and he works so hard. It's, and it's a, it's a different hard work to maybe what I do or all the tour guys do. Like he's not necessarily training all the time and, and doing all this stuff, but if there's a swell, he's going, he's chasing clips, he's arranging photographers, he's driving overnight with, skis or whatever he needs to get photos and video and and it's it's almost non-stop like our schedule's really structured you know when you're going to be where you're going to be here 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 for this long and this many days and his or well, those guys seem like it's like oh there's a swell coming here and then if you really want to there's a swell halfway across the world over there and that could be cool and then three days after that there's another one here and then okay i might just have a, a month off but then if you want, like, if you really wanted to chase it and work hard, it's, you could work just as hard, if not harder than I think we do. Um, and I think some of those guys do it really well and they're a bit under, maybe underrated in how, how much work ethic they actually have. I know Creed works really hard. Noah too. I saw him in Hawaii last year and he was there almost the whole season. Um, but I just think that, they have this uh, attitude and kind of stereotype that they just go and have fun and Image, party yeah, and drink sure, yeah. and, and they're having the best time and then they'll go out and surf occasionally and get sick clips. And, um, but I definitely see another side where they work really hard and I, I, I felt like I was in that for a while as well, trying to juggle both. I, I talked to Dan Godowskis about that last year and we were talking about, he's like, you know, there's a lot of young kids that like, just see that image of whoever, you know, like Noah or Dion or Craig or Dane or whoever. And they're like, 
yeah, that's me. Like I'm never putting a singlet on again. I'm eight, you know, it's, I'm doing that now. I'm drawing the logos on my boards and stuff. But Dane made a really good point. He's like, you know, no, every single one of those guys has a competitive pedigree. Like Absolutely. They, they had to learn like those fundamentals somehow. And he goes, it's just, he, you know, for him, he was like, you know, it just, he ended up going wherever he felt like he was sharpening and surfing the most. Mm -hmm. And he goes, without it, like you're not allowed to do anything, compete yeah. or put out clips or anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a really good point. But yeah, the the other thing is they all did have competitive backgrounds. Like Dane, obviously, arguably the most successful free surfer ever. And he was on tour for three, four, five years, something Finished like that. Finished fourth in the world. Yeah, exactly. Um, Geordie's still fighting for world titles and he's probably the best free surfer, one of the best free surfers in the world. I, I don't know whether that kind of if you could call those guys free servers because they're so attuned to everything they do but and they're competing full time so um i don't know whether they'd fall under that banner necessarily geordie anyway or julian or whoever it is but um i think the point you're making before about like maybe in 2020 more so than in a year before it like it bleeds more you know where yeah. it's not just like that spectrum that we're talking about it's like everyone's on the same spec everyone's a surfer you know like there's not someone that's like a militant one way or the other like maybe there is i don't know but, but um, it feels like it's all it all kind of people are all really like taking different parts of surfing however they can get it and like using that to improve yeah and i also i also think that it's surfing is like you just said it's got so many avenues now it's uh the like maybe the market for surfing isn't as I feel it's still growing, but it seems to me that the industry is kind of um, not th thriving as much as it should be. But there's so many people that can express themselves on a hundred different boards. And then there's guys that can put on a rashi and go out and compete and just blow people's minds. Or there's someone that can, you know, work for a year. That's another point about the free serving. You might go for three swells and get skunked on them and it's like getting a couple of 30 thirds or something, you know, and, and people don't see that work that they put in to maybe get nothing out and they only see the best stuff at the end. Sure. Um, but like, yeah, someone can go and put out a 10 minute edit that just blows everyone's mind or paddle out for 30 minutes and get incredible scores or ride a alternative board at a, great wave and surf for a session and have some amazing footage or you know it's 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 pretty insane where the sport is right now of of that many different kind of perspectives and everyone pushing the limits and the envelope of of what they're trying to do and i think it's really building the sport up well you 27 um <laughs> you're 27 um you know you're into your third year on tour um you've had your rookie year you've had your can style year you've been through a lot what what do you and maybe you don't even think about it but like what kind of legacy do you want ryan callanan to leave um whether it's with your family or your friends like how do you how do you kind of view the road ahead uh it's something that you I guess you think about it a lot, but it's hard to come up with an answer. Uh, I just, I think a legacy for me would be something, and I don't necessarily know what it is, but it's something that I would, I'm happy to be. Whatever I am, as long as I'm happy, as long as I'm having fun and I'm doing what I want to do for my own reasons whether that's how it's portrayed from the outside or not. Um, I think the when all that stuff comes together, that's when the legacies are made and made up and I think that's when they, they're correct. And I just want to be seen as myself and hopefully portray that and everyone else wants to be similar or not similar to me but similar like as in everyone else wants to be themselves as well but i haven't really thought of a legacy in i want to be this world champion or that or the <laughs> results wise i'd rather be a, you know seen as a happy guy that enjoyed life and took risks and went for it 
But that's too good an answer. I'm not going to be able to ask that question again. <laughs> okay. Well, before we go, we'd have uh, the lightning round. 10 questions. Answer as fast as you can. If you had one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? <sighs> thruster. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? <sighs> pizza. Last book you read? I'm reading Shantaram at the moment. Best surf film ever. <laughs> Campaign. One wave you never have to go back to. <laughs> That's a brutal one. Uh, Trig Beach. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you only got to surf one way for the rest of your life. Macaronis. Best person to share the lineup with. My dad. Worst person to share the lineup with. <laughs> oh, man. Can't answer. <laughs> they, no they probably no know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Being myself. Ryan Callanan, thank you, buddy. Thanks, Dave. So that's it. That's our conversation with Ryan Callanan. I hope you enjoyed it. A huge thank you to Ryan for his time and insight and honesty. What an amazing person, and I'm excited to see how the 2020 season starts for him. As mentioned in the upfront, the QS 5000 events in Newcastle are in full swing, so check it out at worldsurfleague.com and the WSL app. And if you haven't listened to the other pods, please download, listen, and subscribe if you like them. They're available wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back next Tuesday. I hope you get some waves wherever you are, and we'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked it. Keep it locked here on WSL for all the action. And don't forget to subscribe, watch more videos, and leave a comment below.